Welcome to all my professional friends. On behalf of Bangalore branch, I welcome you all, all of you for today's study circle on the topic issues in corporate governance practices in India. Today we have with us eminent speaker CS S N Prabhu to present our topic. I request Bangalore branch chairman Shaman to kindly escort him on the desk. I also request him to kindly welcome our speaker by presenting the floor of okay. Applause, Thank you, Sharma. To briefly introduce about our speaker, Mr. Pramod is a become graduate, FCS and insolvency professional having over 20 years of experience in secretariat, legal, strategic management, risk management and general management. He specializes corporate loss, mergers and acquisitions, corporate restructuring, survey regulations and capital market loss. He is presently partner of BMP and Co. LLP, a firm of company secretaries. The firm is the secretarial auditor for listed and unlisted companies. He has addressed professionals in CA Confederation of Indian Industry and CS chapters for professional development programs. He has been judged in the MOOC court competitions conducted by ICSI. His areas of specializations are survey regulations, corporate governance, mergers and acquisitions and corporate laws and secretaries. Audit. With this very brief introduction, I welcome you to today's session, sir. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, what I try to do is we try to have a lot more interactive sessions. So, what I was expecting is let's have a, as a conversation and not as a monologue. Because corporate governance per se is more on a, not the law per se, but I think it's got more to do with the experiences that we face in the company when you're working on a day to day basis. So, that's what I would like to uh, state uh, before I start off the session. So since the topic is issues on corporate governance, I thought let us deal with what are the issues that we are going to face when you say corporate governance and who are the people involved when you say corporate governance. So the people involved when you say corporate governance is going to be, first is going to be the shareholders or the owners, that is who has a very big impact on. Then the board of directors because they are the one who run the company, they are in charge. Next is going to be the management because management is the one which runs the day-to-day -day affairs of the company. Then regulators because they are the one who ensure things don't go bad. So the regulators are there. The most important is going to be the customers for whom the corporations exist. I think if you don't have the customers, then obviously the corporation will not exist. That is the thing. And last, the employees, the people who actually work in the company to make the corporation what it is. So these are the people uh, who want to be the stakeholders in this corporate governance. So we'll take up each of these people how the corporate governance has an impact. Uh, since uh, we are all uh, professionals, so I thought let us go with a bit of a definition kind of a thing. So what do you mean by corporate governance? Corporate governance is the acceptance of the management of the inalienable rights of the shareholders as the true owners of the corporation and their own role as trustees on behalf of the shareholders. It is about commitment to values, about ethical business conduct and making a distinction between personal and corporate funds in the management of a company. So most important thing here is going to be, one, the shareholders are the owners of the company. That is something which is there. The board of directors only act as trustees and they are not the owners of the company. They act as trustees for the shareholders. So that becomes very much important. And the board of directors need to act in a way that they don't breach the trust of the shareholders. That is very much important. Uh, the top 20 CEOs in America signed off on this thing called as common sense approach for corporate governance. This is the principles on which they signed off, saying according to us every company needs to comply with this for corporate governance. And the first signature is by Warren Buffett. So I thought let me pick this up and put it across because uh, that really sets the tone uh, the thing. So what they say is truly independent corporate boards are vital to effective governance. So no board can be beholden to the CEO or management. Every board should meet regularly without the CEO present and every board should have an active and direct engagement with the executives below the CEO level. So what they need to here say is one, the board needs to be independent. The board needs to take its own decisions and not just say yes to whatever the CEO or the managing director is saying. That is the first important thing that they are saying. And two, you also need to meet the other executives of the company. That is one level below the management. 
so that you actually also understand what's happening in the company. So that is one thing which they say you need to have. That diverse board makes diverse decisions, better decisions. Sir. Yeah. That means you need to have a diverse board. You cannot have only one people of the same this thing, then you will not get new ideas. I mean, that is the most important thing. I mean, uh, let's assume uh, the company is an FMCG company. Then you need one person who is good in accounts, who is good in marketing, who is good in regulatory or who is good in uh, chemicals or whatever. I am just giving an example. So that when you have people from various walks of life, then only you will get a better ideas and you get a diverse game. So that is something which is very much required. Then every board needs a strong leader who is independent of the management. That is, in the board of directors, you need to have one person who is going to be strong and be independent from the management. That is, who can tell the management saying no. So that is something that is very much required. And then, companies should not feel obligated to provide earnings guidance, so they should focus on long-term earnings. That is something which is not happening in the US or not in India, where uh, it's quarter say quarter that. That is, everybody is interested in what was your earnings in the last quarter. So nobody looks at the long-term effect of whatever decisions you are taking. CEOs want to take some decisions which is good for that quarter, so you can just show the numbers to the stock exchange and to the institutional investors that have achieved these numbers. So they are saying take a long-term view because that is what makes the business grow and not every quarter. Then common accounting standard is critical for corporate transparency. I think that is what regulators have done as far as the NDAs and bringing all those things apart. Then, effective governance requires constructive engagement between the company and its shareholders. Last but not the least, always have a dialogue between your shareholders to understand what they want and where you are going. So that there is no mismatch between what the shareholders are thinking and what the company is doing. That becomes very much important. Okay. So, why corporate governance? This is from the issue perspective I am talking about. In the issues in corporate governance, what do you think is the bigger problem in corporate governance? One <coughs> sorry, is going to be with regard to ambition. The ambition of the CEO may be something which is very different than the, what the shareholders may want. The ambition of the CEO may be, I want to be number one, my sales need to be number one, I am not worried about profits. So I am just giving an example. Or the ambition of the CEO may be, I want to be larger than life. Which may be good for the company or may not be good for the company. Because if the CEO goes down, the company also goes down with him. So that could be one this thing. Then avers is where it is greed at all cost. That is there is only greed, that is I want everything. That is the board decides that they want to take everything for themselves. Not share it with the other stakeholders at all. So that is going to be another issue. And last but not the least is apathy. What happens is when the independent directors decide saying boss the management knows what it is doing. Why should I interfere? Let them just run the show. I just come attend board meetings and go back. Where they do not uh, feel uh, that they need to take a stand. If that becomes, then you have a problem as far as corporate governance is concerned. Yeah. Uh, CEO will be excluding his uh, board of 
character, he will not be included in your theory and uh, it's for a decision making. Is that what it is? No, this is basically from American concept because then the CEO is on the board. Where it is all widely held. So, who controls the entity? 
then in this kind of situation the board controls the entity. But who runs the entity? The management runs the entity, it's not the board. The board comes only once a quarter and meets for a board meeting and goes. So at the end of the day it becomes a management which is running the company on a day to day basis. Okay, then most important is going to be what is the financial oversight. So as far as the financial oversight is concerned, when you have the management, then you have the audit committee, then you have the board and then of course you also have the auditors, internal auditors, everybody looking into it. So that becomes that. And then what are the other control mechanisms? In India, thanks to the group structure that we have and so many family owned groups and everything is there, you may not even have a main shareholder sitting on every company as a board or whatever. Whether he's on the board or he's not on the board, he's still able to control those companies. You're able to understand. He's still able to control the company even without not being on the board, without even not even uh, being actually shareholder of the company. Some other company owns the share, but then still he's able to control the whole company. So that is something again which is there. So typically if you look at a governance structure of any company then it is going to be one is going to be the shareholders and other stakeholders on top. Below them is going to come the board of directors what we just discussed. The chief executive officer, the MD, that's what we just talked about and then below them comes the management. So this will be the typical structure of any organization. Then if you look at it, uh, the other most important person in this thing is going to be the auditor. Because he is the one who has to ensure things actually are happening what should happen. So the auditor is also going to be the most important person over there. And then you have the various committees of the board which help for the company. Okay, so all these people are accountable to go to the shareholders. But the delegation of powers happen from the shareholders to the board and down. So that is what basically happens. So what I thought was let us pick up some of the important uh, issues as far as corporate governance is concerned. The whole idea of corporate governance has always been based on one important functionary called the independent director. So I thought let us take that up as the first this thing. So what does the company's act says? Independent directors are required to act as what? Conscious keepers of the board, vigilant workers, protectors to the interests of the minority shareholders as well as other stakeholders and implementators of the regulatory norms. So this is the role and responsibility as far as the independent director is concerned. Is specifically mentioned as minority shareholders? Yeah. Okay. So let's look at what the Chairman says as far as uh, independent directors are concerned. One, he says, I am angry show the lack of independence of the independent directors in India. So, the person who he says is an independent director, said he himself, is chairman himself, is saying, well, are these guys really independent? Okay, then, independent directors have no commitment to any cause. Some independent directors are at the mercy of the promoter. So that means that independent only in name sake, whatever the promoter says, these guys will just say yes and move on to life. There is no this thing. Okay, then most important he says is ensuring the independence and spirit of independent directors and their active participation. How do you ensure the independent directors actively participate in the board meeting? I mean, if you look at it, most of the board meetings generally what happens is the chairman comes, he talks, everybody listens and just go off. I mean, hardly any interaction happens and there is no, no questions asked, no this thing happened. Uh, so that is what generally board meetings happen. So what he is trying to question is, was are you independent enough to question people? So these were the statements he just made just before forming of the quota committee. After he made this statement, and all the next thing he did was form the quota committee in Company and said, okay, fine, we can redraft the LODR. So, this is what it is about. The, the crucial issue in relation to independent directors in India is that majority of the shareholders appoint independent directors. That is noticeable in India and most of the huge corporations, shareholders are either individuals or family members. If you look 
when the Tata uh, this thing happened, one of the bigger this thing for corporate India was it was the first time that an independent director got removed, where they said you are acting against the interests of the majority shareholder, and the majority shareholder took a stand that we need to remove remove an independent director. So Muslim Wadia, who was the independent director in two of the Tata companies, Tata Steel and Tata Chemicals, was removed. This was the first time that a shareholder took an action against an independent director. That is, a promoter took an action. So if that person was independent and he said something which is against you, then how can you take action against him? So that became the serious point of debate. So if you look at uh, the position of independent directors in India, most of the family-run companies have enough voting power that they can remove any director in India. So, if an independent director is there at the beck and call, that is, he can be removed by the promoter, then why will he be independent? So, is that going to be a deterrent for somebody to be an independent director? That can be an issue as far as corporate governance is concerned. So one of the things of independent directors in India is independent directors in India are felt to be an extension of the promoter group or those playing ball to the views of the controlling shareholder. So generally, independent directors are generally considered to be yes men who only say yes to what all the promoters or the board is doing and move on with it. To require them to work dispassionately to serve the interests of the minority shareholder in the corporate board is a big ask. I mean, how many of them stand up and say, okay, I want to stand in for the minority shareholder? Till today, that has not happened to me. Sir, actually independent director is not appointed by the minority shareholders. Independent director is appointed by all the shareholders. So that includes the promoter. The goal is to take care of the interests of the minority shareholders. That's what SEBI expects them to do. But the problem is how many of them are doing it and that becomes a problem. The majority shareholder or the big chunks, you know, uh, the shareholders are appointing for the on the behalf of the minority. Correct. I mean, we still don't have a correct way of actually identifying independent director and getting them on board. That is where one of the other slides that we we'll talk about. That is where the whole issue comes up. Just as the central government appoints uh, government nominee directors and all that. Sir, like, uh, sir, PSUs are different, uh, this thing only. I, I didn't want to get into it, but if you look at the PSUs, uh, none of them are in compliance with uh, LODI. There are a lot of PSUs which don't have independent directors. You'll be surprised they don't even have open directors. Okay. 
So what they did, the modus operandi was simple. First and foremost, you give the money to a fully owned subsidiary. If you look at the Companies Act provisions, 186 fully owned subsidiary, you don't have to take members approval, nothing is required. You can just lend the money to the fully owned subsidiary. Now the fully owned subsidiary is a company which is not a listed company obviously. So you, don't, you will not have any independent directors there, you will not have anything. So that company will then lend to whoever they want. That is again controlled by these people. So they lend money to other companies. And the thing is, whichever company took money from them, that those companies were then bought over by the promoters. So when I lend, lend to the other company, they are not a related party. So I don't have to comply with section 188, I don't have to look at section 185, 185, all those things are not to be taken care of. So first you lend money to that company and then you buy that company later. So they completely circumvented all the provisions of the Companies Act and then they got the money. Okay. Then what happened when this new news item broke that the money has been siphoned off and everything, both the brothers resigned. And then what they did is they appointed other people as directors. And who are the other people who are appointed as directors? One who, who was a CEO of another good company of theirs for the last 13 years. So that means he was there personally. Then one of the promoter's father-in-law is appointed. Then one more person who is appointed as an independent director is also an independent director of another two, three companies of their own group. So they brought in the board, also all those guys who are all connected to them some way or the other. But then if you look at the Companies Act, they are all independent. So these are the people whom they have brought in as directors. But then of course, uh, this is the first time that you are seeing when the shareholders actually said no. So a lot of the financial institutions who had shares in Fortis came back and they asked the company for a removal of directors under 169. So this is the first time that the institutional shareholders pushed the company to hold a EGM for removal of directors and all these people got removed. So this is the first time that we are actually seeing a kind of a shareholder activism takes place where they say boss we don't want these kind of directors. And the foreign institutional uh, shareholders brought in their own people as independent directors. So, this is the change in actually the way corporate governance is going to be played out now in India. So, even if the Indian financial institutions or Indian shareholders don't act, you can be rest assured the FIIs, if they have enough holding in that particular company, they are going to force you to act. So, that is what is going to happen. In the US as well as India, comparison, the US has a lot of structure, kind of a management channel. Hmm. But uh, there are also some dominant businesses. You see, whether Microsoft or Apple or Intel or. Uh, no, sir, actually, you look at. No, no. It's a single man started company. Right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a single man started company, but then once they go public, they lose control over the company. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, Facebook, is a bit of a thing where. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, because of the voting shares that he has, that has uh, differential voting rights, he controls 50%. But if you look at a Google or if you look at a Microsoft or an Apple, none of the founders have so much shares that they can influence anyone. If you look at Apple, Apple it's completely publicly owned. So there they are don't. corporations are promoted by individual family members, so then they start. I mean, they start that way out, but then once they become big, it completely gets. The whole less than 50%. 50% is extremely possible in any of these companies. Even in Amazon, where Jeff Boss is there, even he doesn't have 50% in Amazon. Which is today the world's largest company by market capitalization. This is another interesting case, uh, ICCI, I mean, uh, now that she has been asked to step down and uh, go on wrongly, but she is still not fully out. But what is more this thing is when the matter actually came up to the board, the board immediately gave a clean check. 
the first reaction of the board is everything is about board, nothing has happened. And for two years they were sitting on it without doing anything. It's only when the what they say is when the news hits the newspaper, I mean, only when it becomes news, that is when the TV channels or the newspapers pick it up, then only board acts. I mean, till the news is not out to the public, no action is taken. So, that is really uh, the thing. So, the independent directors immediately gave a clean check to the board, uh, said everything is above board, no problem. Uh, as far as Companies Act is concerned, uh, she has given all declarations, there is no conflict. So, these are the kind of statements that first came out. And when more and more news started coming out, then suddenly the board said, yeah, I think there is something. So, I think this is where the independent directors fail as far as corporate governance is concerned. I mean, once you get it, why don't you push for something and get an investigation done and take a stand? Really good, yeah. Sir, so if the independent director is not acting, why will the other group act? Because the other group is, is, is with the management only, right? So that is where the, this thing comes. Uh, Rallyger is again uh, the same thing brothers, that is the two brothers itself. Uh, here, 300 million was actually siphoned off from the company. 300 million dollars is what I'm talking about, not one crores, uh, was routed to, to promote group companies. And what they did was again the same modus operandi is, is done, give the loan to a subsidiary company, which is then only controlled by them, no other independent director, nobody else, and then they just give notes to whom the loan. And in in this case, what happened is the foreign financial institution investors have actually filed a operation mismanagement case, which is right now going on in Delhi LCA. Where they actually gone and filed a case saying, stop these people from dealing with the company, they cannot give any more loans, they cannot do this. So they have actually pushed the company to a corner by filing the case. This is also the first time where you have seen an independent uh, foreign financial institution holder going in for operation mismanagement. Generally, operation mismanagement is generally filed by two warring parties who are promoters both sides. Where one person says, I am oppressed and I am doing something. This is the first time where actually a listed company, ordinary shareholders are actually calling for operation mismanagement. <coughs> then uh, let us come to uh, women directors. So when the companies act came, yeah. Yes, Sir, I think what you can do is, I mean, uh, there are no right to this thing, but we have to work out a mechanism. For example, auditors. Uh, once I appoint an auditor, at least for the next five years, the auditor is safe. I mean, the management cannot remove him. It's another matter, the auditor can listen. Can we look at something like that for the independent directors? Because anyway, you appointed him for five years, so that five years you can't touch him. But the problem will come is what happens if the independent director is not functioning? Because for the auditor, at least there are, there are regulations in place which forces the auditor to function. The auditor is responsible for a lot of other people, not just the company. Whereas for independent director, that this thing is not there. So we will have to strike a right balance. When I come to the NRC, I will deal with it a bit more. That this thing. Uh, then if you look at uh, woman uh, representation, if you look at the way it is, it's very less. It is just 
for the board of women. Compared to our population, it's a very uh, this thing. And if you look at uh, again from an industry perspective, uh, if you look at energy manufacturing, the number of women are very less. It's only in telecom, IT, the new age industries where we have a lot more women representation. And so you were talking about PSU, so I thought I'd just tell you, if you look at it, PSU is less than 10%. Yeah. So and the irony is today they also are talking about women's reservation bill in the parliament, but the government itself is not acting, sir, actually. So if you look at it, seven companies did not have women directors at all last year. Only one is a private sector one, which is s -Bank. Other than that, all the others are all public sector undertakings. It's a mandatory one, sir. So who is the mandatory authority? Sir, actually MC has a question. And since it's a listed company also, even city can question. But then these are all government companies, right? So who's going to question the government company? I mean, one arm of the government cannot question the other arm of the government, so. Uh, open director, uh, why open director? I mean, that is the first question. Which I want to ask you, the audience, saying, why open director? I mean, Then is the role of open director any different from any other director? No, I mean the director is a director, there's no this thing as well as woman director, this thing is then is it a step for empowerment of women in the corporate world? I mean, this is something which is not just India specific, but across the world. Even even in other parts of the world, uh, for women, it's very difficult to break the glass ceiling. I mean, if you look at, if you women across the world, if you look at how many women CEOs are there across the world, it's very less. So that's why when the Indra Gandhi becomes the CEO of Pepsi, everybody so so that is one. Uh, this thing. Actually, the movie has to start right from the scratch. To have produce a top level market. Yeah. So maybe the initial or the current Then what happens in a promoted driven company? Again in India we, we, we always find uh, innovative solutions for everything. So we have found innovative solutions in here also. It says woman director, okay fine, so the woman has to be from the family itself. So this is something which is uh, the thing. So you may put a company as long as has and said no, you need to bring in an independent director. So the problem in India is you need to bring in a law for everything. I mean people will not do anything on their own. So that is again the issue of corporate governance in my opinion. Actually, that is the problem. They think by enacting a law, they have sorted the problem. But there is no implementation. The moment any problem crops up, they have enacted a law. But there is no one to implement that. Sir, so uh, they are saying don't cross the yellow line, but there is no one to watch. So if you are caught or if you are observed, then it becomes a crime. Otherwise, it is not a crime. Sir, I mean, it also got to do with our own mentality as yeah. Indians or whatever, sir. I mean, you look at it, okay, the same Indian if he goes to the US, yeah. you have to cross the road, you only cross it in the yellow line, you will not cross it anywhere else. But in India, it's the only place where you never cross it in the yellow line. It doesn't exist. Huh? It doesn't exist. Gender crossing. No, fine, but I'm just saying, I mean, it's more of a metaphor. But what I'm trying to tell you is, uh, if you go outside India, you would like to observe the law 100%. But when it comes to being in India, we have this shelter attitude which says, okay, fine, yeah, nothing will happen. Let's just go on. That is the thing. That means there is no implementation of the execution. 
Actually, Norway become, became the first uh, country in the world where it said 40% 40, 40 of your board needs to have women directors. And they set a very strict deadline. So within three years of this law coming into force, all the boards need to have 40%. And it has become one of the most world successful program, which of course uh, EU has also started adopting. So each of the countries have also started adopting it. So India is not the only country where you are trying to push in this thing. In fact, we are being very late and very slow. If you look at the aggressiveness of the EU countries, it's very high. But what Norway, there have been a lot of reports on it which has already come out, which can actually Google and look at it. So what Norway says is, all those companies have started to perform a lot more better after diversity into the board. So they are saying, forget anything from a business angle, only just bring in more women on the board. The companies start performing better. But, uh, don't you think some of these regulations, they just copied from the West? And something like this, what is the need in India? I mean, uh, a director becomes a director on, her, on his or her own, uh, own merits. So there's, there's no, I, I, at least the companies that I have seen, there's, there's no antipathy towards women. As in, she's in the senior management, she does well, she'll come become a director. So it looks very, uh, like, you know, it's not in the right time, at least, like, and there are so many other problems to solve. So just, this is just, this will be another uh, dead letter in the world. Uh, and and all, and all these European nations, I mean, they have so many other things going on. Uh, <coughs> political left, and feminism, and, and so on and so on. So statistics can always be, you know, massaged to pre present that, you know, market cap of these companies, where there are women directors are gone or Do you think so? So, I mean, this is not about market cap, but this is more about the profits. That's what they're talking about. Uh, okay, I'll just give you an example of uh, the boards that where, uh, where I was in employment and what I've seen the board and everything. Uh, what what we have actually seen is uh, the women directors ask lot more questions than the men director. And they also bring in a bring, bring in a different angle to the business. <coughs> That is what actually we have actually seen in the, this thing. So, generally what happens in the board of directors is, let's face it, this is a old boys club. Old boys club. That is, I know people, only those guys are going to be my board of directors. So the diversity never comes into play. But the shareholders are only appointing the directors, right? As in most of the companies of uh, listed companies, or even if you take companies where there are private equity holdings which are large, I mean, if they find uh, eligible directors from the market, they just appoint good people. I mean, you, I mean, except for these Ambani's and family control businesses, they probably fear that some woman director will raise questions. Um, you really think that it has to be in company law that, you know, woman direct. I mean, I find it very, uh, I mean, where's the gender issue in all these things? I mean, those who have a mindset only put these things in the law. And if you're open about it, I mean, I don't think I need to leave it in the law and then say, okay, I'll go around. And, uh, uh, so, basically, all these things come up is because, look, there are uh, two things here. One is a tick mark exercise, and one is the spirit of the law. Okay. But if you look at corporate governance per se in India, it's always been a tick mark exercise and never in the spirit of the law. In case the company has uh, diversity and inclusivity in their agenda, uh, the functioning is quite different. For example, you know, uh, our left brain and right brain function in a different manner. We don't expect a right brain person to act as a left brain person. So similarly, when a woman comes in, especially in soft skill uh, functions like HR, to give an example, they do bring a lot of more compassionate and happy towards uh, uh, the fellow employees. They bring in certain different, uh, what your point of view or empathy in the organization. So I think they are needed in the organization. That's why it's been 
especially in case of whatever you said, uh, uh, European company and all, the diversity has to be minimum 25% and over a period of time that needs to be maintained. That's the core agenda of those organizations now. And it works well. And the, in, in case you Google it out, in case you find a research, this company has been on the Next item is this thing is again a corporate corner. This thing is going to be on succession planning. That is who's going to take over next. That is something which is a lot desired in the Indian uh, this thing. The process of identifying and developing new leaders who can replace the old leaders. That is who is going to replace you once you are out. As for the CEO or whatever that this thing is concerned. So that becomes a very big challenge. In, in case of promoter driven companies, it's very clear. I mean. Uh, you have a promoter, you know very well sure it's going to be his son or daughter who's going to take over. That is very, uh, very this thing. Succession planning does not, is not uh, this thing over there. But then what about those companies which are actually professionally run? At least there you expect the succession plan to be a lot more better or thing, even there also it doesn't happen that way. So that is a challenge. But then if you look at the sort of budget clients in India, are they really able to do a succession planning? Then no. Most of the companies are found wanting here and struggling. I think the classic case can be Tata Motors. Uh, and then of course Infosys, which is closer home to us in Bangalore, where even they had some problems. Uh, first one I would like to take is Tata Motors. Uh, the managing director of Tata Motors committed suicide in Bangkok. He just jumped out of the hotel window. And it took Tata Motors two years to bring in a new person. I mean, Tata Motors is such a big company. I mean, you can imagine the number of employees they have, the kind of stakeholders they have, the number of shareholders they have. But then it took such a big company two years to get in a managing director. Whereas, as everybody says, succession planning is there in the LODR, which clearly says every company needs to have this in the if even if that is there, then how come they don't get anyone? Okay. Then uh, look at Infosys. Uh, the irony is Infosys also has a leadership development institute of their own in Mysore. I mean, uh, after uh, Dharan Murthy and Mr. Nandan uh, stepped down, from then on they have a leadership crisis actually. From then on it was not settled, settled at all. And then Vishal Sika came, he went off again, they did not have anyone. So for four months it was actually vacant. Mr. Nayak has also virtually held LNT for a long time. In fact, I don't know, I didn't want to put that up, but 
you should go back and look at one of, one of his interviews, he said he doesn't find anyone who can replace him, is the statement he made. Now that's a very dangerous statement, I mean, no person can be so indis indispensable to anyone, I mean, let's face it, for an organization. I mean, one of the things you expect a leader is that he builds more leaders. But that is something that doesn't seem to be happening in India. I still remember the classic, uh, this thing where in a ship which seems uh, from India to London they are going in a tank there are some frogs and there is no, uh, what should I say, the tank has no lid on top. So one of the person goes to another English person and says there is no lid on the top, the frog will just jump out. He says no, no, there are Indian frogs, if one tries to jump on, the other one will pull it down. So, I mean, uh, so, where is the thing for creating leadership? So, that is again... Uh, is it Sundarman or S.N. Subramanian? Huh? The name Sundarman is correct? Yeah. Or is it S.N. Subramanian? Look at all last I saw, so, I'll just be checked. But even L.N.T. has an issue where he is continuing now for, as non executive chairman, and nobody knows when he is going to step down, so... H.T.S.C. Huh? H.T.S.C. So, but at least his bureau of the CEO was long time back. Bank at least that mystery has taken over at long time back. So, at least there, this thing happened long back, and like these were they continue for a longer. But even there, you will have problem. Even ICICI also, Mr. Kamath was there for a long, long time. Therefore, even Western companies also, you see in government sector, today that the system has seen it. But today they have not changed, sir. I mean, Australia is doing the next. Sir, Finland is okay, sir, but here it just continues, I mean, 20, 25 years is what we are talking about. And if you look at GE also, uh, even there, uh, Jack Wells, one of his this thing was the CEO of GE, he needs to have 20 years. But his uh, successor never had 20 years. There is, they sent him out saying, was you are not performing. Jeff was removed uh, last year. So the, the problem of apartment of independent directors actually comes in from this committee. Because this is the committee which actually has to recommend independent directors or any other directors who is going to be appointed to the board. But how does this committee function is always a issue whether they are functioning independently, whether they are recommending directors of their own or is it whatever the promoter is recommending that they are just saying it is their recommendation and people are getting appointed. So the whole uh, problem comes in from this nomination, nomination company not being independent. So if you are a member of the nomination, nomination company, you need to be looking out for who is going to be a better fit for the board and who do I approach to bring in. But the members of the nomination, nomination company will never even look at it on that way basis. Whenever you have one of the promoters saying I want to take this person as a director, they look at him then recommend that person being appointed as director. So that is what happens. That is one issue. Then the other issue of NRC is going to be with regard to board evaluation. How does board evaluation take place? And here, basically when I mean board evaluation, it means one, I evaluate myself. And two, I also evaluate by other members on the board. And generally the way the boards are structured in India, it is due to everyone on the board. So it becomes like this same boss, I'll take care of you, you take care of me. And for most of the board this is done because it's a regulatory requirement, generally you do it just before 31st of March happens, so you need to have one board meeting just before that one and that is something which, on which what we do is we put in enough other agenda items so that this doesn't get enough 
time. And everybody is separated before and we will ask them to just fill it up and come to forehead. Everybody just exchanges and <laughs> over. So the tick marking is done and everybody is happy. But if you look at the same thing in the UK, uh, if you are a listed company and you are quoted on the London Stock Exchange, then once in three years your evaluation has happened by an independent person. That is, you need an outside expert to come in and do the evaluation. So, that will be the next step I think even in India once people realize things are not working that way so you can expect things to move that way. Then, nomination and remuneration committee functioning, let's look to payment of directors. That is how are the directors being paid. If you had actually looked at yesterday's economic times, they have actually even given the median saying how much is the executive salary compared to the lowest kind of company. How many times it is more? ITC it is somewhere around 500 times. So you can look at the way uh, this thing happens. So if you look at uh, the CEOs of a lot of the companies, Lasser uh, and Dubo is 78 crores. So a lot of the CEOs get paid a lot. So, this is all decided by the NRC company. So, that is where is the NRC being playing a proactive role. But if you put a similar slide for Western companies, what? Yes. Western companies, US and UK. No. Mm -hmm. The same picture, there are not. We are not different. What I am trying to say is, rejecting only Indian companies is not a fact. Western companies are the same picture appears. The ratio is 1000 times. You take any corporate CEO's number. So, actually, yesterday, the account times was given. I'll come back to the next slide. It is, uh, it looks like this. You can just see the, see the global CEO pay average income. Uh, it's only in the US and India that you have a huge number. That is, US it is 265 is the median, in India it is 229. But if you look at Europe, they are all below 200. So we are aligning to USA? I mean, we are more aligned to the, towards the US. Yes. China is the lowest. And in case of promoter CEOs, their salary is actually higher than the professional CEOs. It's actually ironic because they also get higher dividends. Santi is husband and wife. Yeah. Then if you look at Tata Motors, uh, what happened was uh, they also had paid a huge regulation to their directors and everything. And because director's salary is a related party transaction, the, the related party cannot vote. So for the first time actually, you actually saw the shareholders voting against the resolution. Then Tata Motors actually reached out to a lot of the shareholders to the financial institutions and told boss this is what is what we are doing and everything and all. And then only next year they have to retable the resolutions and then activate it. The whole corporate governance biggest issue is with this regard is always going to be on related party transactions. That is transactions happening with the related party. And the most important work of the corporate governance is going to be what? Protect the minority shareholder. So, this is where the whole bigger challenge is. So, what are the kind of related party transactions that happen? One, between group companies. Not much details are given. You don't give out the required information that is being required. Then relatives of directors are appointed at huge revelations. Then 
frequent mergers and amalgamations happen. You don't even know what's happening. The exchange ratios look very lopsided, very distinct. How it is happening? God knows those, those things happen. Then accounts of subsidiaries, JVs get consolidated, never audited. Then the executive chairman, he is also on the nomination revolution committee. Why the act allows it so he can be, so there is nothing wrong with it, so, but he also sits in the same committee.
and by the time these people built the flag and everything happened, the whole thing changed. But the promoter said they will still do a transaction at the price which was agreed in those days. So what was valued at 1 lakh 17,000 per square foot was told we will sell to the family at 9,200 rupees per square foot. And the land actually belongs to the company, the building actually belongs to the company, not to the promoter. And this is the first time when the shareholders actually went and said no, we will not agree and they voted against it. And any related party transaction, one of the first things is the audit company has to approve. And the same promoter is sitting on the audit company. So, this is just the conflict. Then the other thing is Maruti. Uh, I mean, Suzuki, uh, Suzuki in India uses the name Maruti, and that's what the company is, and that's what they do. And it's a listed company, there are a lot of shareholders in India. Even the government owns 25% of this company and you have <coughs> a lot of public shareholders. And what does Suzuki do? They come and set up another company in India which is a holding on subsidiary. That company will manufacture cars and then sell it to Suzuki, Maruti in India and Maruti will then sell it again. So, the new plant also could have been set up by Maruti itself. But Suzuki did not do it. Suzuki set up its own 100% subsidiary. So the profits will directly go to Suzuki and Indian shareholders will not get anything. So this is one. So they, they want to transfer the existing facilities to the new entity. What was the issue? Not just existing facilities, the existing facility was no, but existing land that they had that they wanted to give it to the other. The new entity. So, but more than anything else, this company itself could have set up the new plant and could have got the whole thing, right? Why you need another? So, that went through, right? Yeah, it went through, sir. Everything went through. Then what happened in January 2014, they said they are going to set up this new plant or whatever. Then the company changed certain terms of the agreement to make it more beneficial to Maruti because the new Companies Act came and where it said if it's a related party transaction, then you need minority shareholders approval and the related party cannot vote. Suddenly they realize if that is the status, then the shareholders may not agree to it. So what they did is they made the terms favorable to the listed company. Then what happened? The companies I got changed again. So special resolution became ordinary. So they again changed the terms. Because getting an ordinary resolution passed in India is very easy, you all know. So they got the new terms passed. I mean, but what happens to the minority shareholder? I mean, that person is there, right? It's a listed company and minority shareholders are there. So what happens to the rights of the minority shareholders? Because they still have, I think, 20% of the minority They still own shares. But there are no management control of the company. But it can be a brand name, right? Like Hero Honda. Similarly, Maruti is Without the Suzuki name, we won't be able to get the market cap. There's another reason behind that. This may not be related to the governance from other business side. Yeah, but you already have a brand name in this company. You're already taking royalty out for that also. Maybe. Okay. Now let's come to the most important company as far as corporate governance, this thing is concerned, which is the art company. 
which is more important as because they are the ones which oversee the financial reporting process and disclosures of the financial information and everything. So the audit company becomes the most important one. They also have to review the financials and the risk management policies. Then you also have to look at reasons for substantial defaults and payments in case of depositors or debentures or shareholders, those things which you look at. Then most important, they also approve what? The terms and fees for the statutory auditors. Then discussion with the external auditors before the audit commences and the nature and scope of audit as well as the post audit discussion to ascertain any areas of concern. Others then review the management, external and internal auditors, adequacy of internal control for any company. How good the internal control systems are as far as thing the company is concerned. Then audit company with related to the external auditor, what are the things they look into? One, to access the qualification, skill, resources, effectiveness, independentness of the external auditor, to seek assurance of the auditors, the staff have no family, financial connections, all those things with the company, to discuss key accounting and audit judgments and levels of awareness, to assess effectiveness of the audit process, to monitor external audit firm's compliance with applicable ethical guidelines. All these things are what we look at. But then if you look at the number of scams that has happened, that is also putting in a lot of pressure on the auditor saying how good their own processes are or how well they are also performing. So if I go back to again to the same FOTUS, uh, this thing that has happened. FOTUS HK was fined 65.98 lakhs by the stock exchanges for non-submission of the financial <laughs> results for the quarter. So, the quarter for September results were only declared in March. I mean, why did the auditors not give a qualified opinion and close it a lot more faster? So, that becomes the question. I mean, at the end of the day, you have only a 40 day time period for you to close the audit. Then this is again a newspaper, uh, this thing, uh, 30 auditors have resigned this year. Look, one of the things that has happened this year is the backlash or whatever happened because of the SEBI order on uh, Satyam's uh, auditors PwC, where they said for two years you can't audit any listed company. So now uh, all the auditors have become very careful as far as the listed company is concerned. If any slip up, anything happens, boss, you lose your whole audit. Because if he's going to say you can't audit, then you know where you go. So because that has happened, you can see a, in a lot of the companies where there were issues or they think there are issues, some of the auditors are just resigned. Just resigned. So after that, the next news item came actually is not just 30 companies, in 42 companies the auditors have resigned. And the auditors have also become a lot more bolder. Uh, it's now for the first time we are seeing in the, some of the bigger companies also they are now talking about going concern. That is we don't know whether this business is viable anymore as a going concern whether these things can survive. Because that is one of the things that you always write in your report, right? The company is a going concern. So now we are saying boss I don't know whether I can say this is going to be a going concern. Uh, if you actually go back and look at month per, month, month person's uh, quarterly results, I mean it's a listed company so they need to give uh, a, a limited review or an audit. Uh, this company chose to give a limited review. If you go back and look at the limited review reports for the last three quarters, Deloitte has not qualified it at all. There's no qualification there. Yeah, so, so and I had a special interest, I looked at it and we have made at least a crore of uh, other consulting income for the listing, getting the listing documents. So, and it's out of a small office in Anubhava, I mean, I think Baroda actually. So, 
you know, the pressure for a small office to sustain. No, no, my thing is that for the first three quarters, how will you do audit? If, if, if the thing you are saying is, he's not giving me information, he's not giving me information, it cannot be that it's only at the end of the year that you are going to ask that information, right? Yeah. I mean, that is what is my uh, whole uh, this thing. So, that was the thing. And if you look at it, most of the auditors who are resigned are all saying they are not giving you information. And everything happens only at the end of the year. What about the first three quarters that you have audited?
with this I include open to the audience for any other questions. What are the major improvements which is in pipeline as of now, the corporate government side? We know a lot of pitfalls are there. Absolutely, when you are there, slightly talked about that it is in the market. Everywhere pitfalls are there, but no doubt. It's evolving, no doubt. It's evolving in the last couple of years with a lot of restrictions, people are falling in line, but it is the same. Things are coming up. So, from the regulatory side? So, from the regulatory side, the quota company recommendations, which the stock exchange has already taken some, uh, that is going to be a big thing because the definition of independent directors are waiting change. It will become a lot more stricter. With regard to women directors, it's now independent. It cannot be family. It cannot be the family anymore. Uh, then, with regard to uh, the way the board functions, even that they are changing. Uh, so, now what they are saying is look, the companies act says you need to have only four board meetings in a year. They are now saying no, you need to have one more extra only for strategy. Those kind of things that you need to have. Even board evaluation, what you need to now disclose, even that will change. And most important, they are now saying please tell me how diversified is your board. That is, you have enough people for everything. Example, if you're, if you're an FMCG company, you have a guy who specializes in marketing. And things are evolving, sir. I mean, things are at least moving up. Because long time back when I attended another seminar like this in corporate governance, one of the uh, proxy advisory firms showed an audit company of a listed company where you had uh, all film stars as audit company members. Today at least time one we don't, we don't have that kind of a farce. Yeah. What about company secretary's role in this entire governance? Is it increased or decreased or the same or not? Talk about the auditors, it's fine. Similarly, the key manager personally basically CEOs and the company secretary see financial officers. So whether their roles have really changed and put a lot of designations come in place how is that? Uh, so the company secretary per se, I mean, uh, let's face it, even he's also trying to find his foot in the thing. He does not have enough powers like what the auditors have or whether this thing has. At the end of the day, he's, he is in the management and he's not a decision maker, he's only the decision implementer. So that is where the, uh, this thing comes up. So you have very few company secretaries who, again, come over and say this is wrong or this is very interesting. That also becomes very difficult. Uh, if you look at uh, another thing is, uh, when this Nira Modi, uh, this thing happened, uh, the company secretary also resigned. After everything that happened, not before. Did they come under the category of key management? Key management. At the end of the day, this is more you have to comply with it more in the spirit than in the law. I think if you comply with more in the spirit, then automatically things will go wrong. Okay, uh, I want to thank ICSI Value Chapter for having uh, invited me for the session. Uh, I hope uh, it was a useful and uh, we actually found it interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. On behalf of all the members present here and on behalf of Pandora Branch of SARC of I thank Mr. Pramod for spending this valuable time for our institute and coming over here and giving an excellent presentation. Big round of applause here, ladies and gentlemen. As a token of gratitude, I would like to present a moment to and request C.A. Golani to kindly come forward and present a moment to our speaker of the day. Huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen.